Poet Laureate Simon Armitage. Congratulations to both of you. I know this has been a, a long year in many ways, and it's a, it's a very moving film. Um, you've, of course, collaborated a number of times together in the past, so can you talk us through how you approached this? What was your, your game plan for how to tackle this enormous topic artistically? Uh, game plan? I mean, I might pass this over to you, Simon. <laughs> well, I, I think one of the unusual aspects of this project was that we had no idea when to finish it, or when to start it, or what to put in the middle. Um, so it was, it was just very open-ended, and we talked a lot at the beginning about you know, what the film would look like, what role the poem would have, what the poetry would mean, and so on and so forth. But I think in the end, you know, because of the situation out there, we just had to work really organically. And I think that's built into the architecture of the film. Um, because month to month, we didn't really know where the story was going. So we didn't know what kind of mm. narrative to, uh, to tell. And um, I think that's actually one of the, the strengths of the film. I think it's ended up being a, a sort of collage, if you like. Um, and we probably thought we were going to make a film in three months and it took us a year, and we probably could still be making it today, actually. Well, of course, because it's still unfolding. Um, I forgot to say, this is how you ask questions. Um, so you, you submit questions via that link onto this iPad so we're not passing the microphone around. So I should have I prefaced that. Brian. I suppose one of the, the early decisions we made was that <clears throat> in our previous films, we've often dropped into other worlds, you know, whether it's the world of prison or pornography or alcoholism and we've Simon's often written words for other people to speak the people yes. in those worlds but with this film we thought well we're all in this you know we're not dropping into somebody's world this is everybody's world so so we made a, an early decision that Simon would both narrate it and and appear in, mm. in vision of the film which I don't think you've ever done before uh, no uh, uh, I think what happened was that you know, during the course of lockdown, I became involved in some other lockdown writing projects, such as the Huddersfield Choral Society pieces. And it just seemed um, churlish, in a way, not to include them in the film, because they were all pointed in the same direction. So yeah, I, 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 I became a kind of uh, character in the, in the film by, by accident, rather than design or casting. Well, I, I sort of knew the director a bit. Well, and it's, so, it's of course, so unusual. And I, I've interviewed a number of filmmakers this year, and, and it's the first time they've sort of been living through the same story that they're telling if they're making a film about the pandemic. Um, so, so I'm wondering how wh about that aspect of it, but also how you began when everybody has a story to tell. We have, we've all have multiple stories to tell. How you began to pick which ones to tell and how you found your quite extraordinary contrib contrib contributors. Uh. Well, we made some, some early decisions about not having you know, kind of famous people in the film and not having medical personnel because they were being filmed for every other film about the pandemic. And Mark Cooper-Jones, who's here, who's the producer, uh, was, was kind of looking for people and we'd talk all the time about the people he was finding. And, and I think we, we wanted to have a, a range of people who would say something to different sections of society. So Victoria, the, the, the mum who does the funny videos about looking after her kids, we thought that she would appeal to all those mums who had spent all, these t all this time, and dads, you know, looking after their kids day after day after day. And you know, we thought that Matthew, who lost his shop, would a appeal to a kind of big section of society who would find that moving and <clears throat> you know, feel some kind of, uh, you know, kind of middle England might might kind of relate to that uh and comfort the the asylum seeker i was keen that we 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 had somebody in the film who would talk about their mental health issues and and she ticked that box so 
it was a kind of question of just seeing loads and loads of people. And that was very difficult because Mark was on the phone to people and doing Zoom calls with them. And it's, it's very hard to gauge somebody and their suitability to be in a film like this without actually sitting with them. So that was, that was tricky. But in the end, you know, we sat down and we said, this, you know, these are the people that we think we can work with. And I was feeding that through to Simon all the time and talking to him about it and talking to Mark Bell, who's the commissioning editor at the BBC. And, you know, by some kind of group consensus, we arrived at the, the people we've got. Well, when you found Comfort, uh, did Comfort understand that you would perform in this quite extraordinary um, dance sequence at the end? Can you talk us through that? Uh, no, she didn't. She had no idea she'd be doing that. But I think one of the things that has been a feature of Simon and I working together and something that I think we, we both value a lot is that you know, in the past, we've asked people to sing in our films. We've asked people to dance in our films. We've asked people to do also to speak poetry, especially written for them. And actually, what's strange is that, you know, you go to somebody and say, "Would you like to sing a song?" And they go, "Yeah." Uh, and it's really extraordinary what people will do. And I think one of the things that we we value about that is that those people become creative collaborators rather than just the subjects of our documentary. And I think it also taps into a belief that we both have that everybody has a creative side to them or a creative impulse that can be brought out if it's, you know, if given an opportunity. I'm just going to ask for people to submit questions by here. I don't have any yet, <laughs> but it is working. So please do if you have them, or we can try to do it another way, but I think that's supposed to be our, our, our last resort. Um, so... Uh, I'm wondering what it was like. You, re you made a reference to it, but could you expand on how you went about d doing the actual filming in the, you know, with all the pandemic guidelines in place and how much that was a factor in sort of your day-to-day -day angst? Oh, we did, the, we did the usual stuff. You know, we took people's temperature. We, we kind of uh, did tests. We kept our distance. We wore masks. Uh, we decided to do... The, the master interviews in a studio rather than going to people's homes because obviously that's, that's a great deal easier to, to keep things safe like that. Uh, and yeah, we just, we just followed the guidelines really. Simon, I'm wondering, can you tell us a little bit about um, how people respond to poetry and singing during times of crisis like this and kind of how, the, how that has been... Uh, uh, your experience in this last year? Well, I think, generally speaking, poetry's had a very strong moment during the pandemic. I've, I've sometimes described poetry as the art form of concentration. You've got to concentrate when you write it. You've got to concentrate when you read it. You've got to concentrate when you listen to it. And not everybody wants to have that level of attendance with language. But I think over the past you know, 15 months, 16 months, people have had time uh, to think more deeply and more clearly about their own lives and to spend more time uh, with art and craft. Um, and poetry one of, is one of those things that's, that's benefited from it. So, it, I mean, I would say this, wouldn't I? Uh, but it felt like an appropriate medium uh, for the for the film as a way of um, capturing and condensing what, not necessarily what people said, because I think, you know, we've lived through a period of over-information and it's become very wearying and exhausting to have facts and figures each night, you know, the results every night of, of infections and deaths and admissions and vaccinations. So a language that describes how people feel, um, how it feels to be in this situation, I think has become valid. And, and can we just speak a moment about music and music in particular? It's referred to in the film that, of course, it was quite a cruel uh, happen, happenstance that singing and choral singing was deemed to be particularly dangerous during the pandemic, but yet that is a sort of group activity that people get so much comfort from of, of all ages. And I think that the demographic makeup of that choir is, is really interesting. Um, I don't know, what are your thoughts on that? 
Well, I, sa I said in the film, it, it, it was very cruel. You know, if somebody had been designing a virus to be cruel uh, to that section of society, a very gentle section of society, you take great comfort in, um, you know, that the, the company that they keep and the activity that they take part in, you, you, you couldn't have hardly have come up with, you know, something more, um, you know, sort of strategic, really. So to be able to, just to be able to give them something back, uh, you know, a song lyric uh, that came with a, a tune and then gave them the opportunity to, to sing about their situation, uh, I, I hope proved very helpful to them. I mean, we, we've talked about this a lot in the past, Brian and myself, about, you know, what, what are we doing with these films? And, at the, you know, at the end of the day, we're trying to make good telly. That's what we're about. Um, but I hope the films that we make are always on the right side in terms of people who contribute to them and, that, you know, that they get something out of, out of them as well. I'm wondering, um, uh, and I'm and I'm I've got a couple questions, which is great. So I'm going to get to them in a second. But just to follow that up, do you ever um, do you have contact with this, your contributors from many films ago that you did work with and and wrote with that had performing sometimes your awards and and what is what are those relationships like? I, I bumped into uh, we made a film called Drinking for England, which is the first film we showed here at Sheffield actually in 1999. Uh, and I recently bumped into one of the people who'd been in that, and I was, I was surprised he was still alive, actually. Uh, and he could hardly remember being in the film. <laughs> uh, so uh, I don't know. I mean, it's, you know, I've been making films for a long time, and, and some people you keep in touch with and some you don't, and it's, it's not to do with... It's to do with what they want as well, you know. Some people just naturally want to stay in touch, and some people don't, so it's, you know... It's hard. Mm. It's hard. It's hard enough, and, and particularly given the last 15, 16 months, it's hard enough keeping in touch with your family. Mm. My, my relationship with uh, the contributors is slightly stranger. Um, not so much in this film, but in all the films that we've made in the past where I'm often writing about people's very intimate circumstances and, you know, sometimes terrible times in their lives and then presenting those issues back to them as verse, I, I, I never meet them. I think in all the films that we've, we've made, I've met one contributor, and that was accidentally. And the reason for that is that, if I, I think if I were to get too close to people sometimes, I, I wouldn't feel strong enough to say the things that I think I need saying in, in the poems. And uh, you know, I'd probably come over all probation officer uh, which is what I used to do, and that's that's you know, it's not useful when you're writing. You need to have some distance and some dispassion uh, to be able to you know make the work strong enough. I could follow that up, but I feel obliged to um, to go to questions because there's some good ones here. Window the window sequence was very moving. Windows during a pandemic. Are windows a shared metaphor for art in both film and poetry? Yeah. <laughs> I agree. Uh, uh, I mean, that we, you know, we talked a lot. You know, one of our contributors, Karen, talked about seeing her mum through the window and only being able to do that. And obviously that was in the news a lot. You know, we, 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 we all heard the stories about people mm -hmm. having to have that pane of glass between them. And, you know, and that became something that was quite important for the film, that we did film a lot of people through glass. And then... That particular sequence, uh, you know, was in, in really moving. Mm, uh, it absolutely was. I thought, even though, you know, they were two young women, they weren't mm -hmm. the normal kind of people who'd be on each side of the glass. But that that was a kind of that was one of the f our first filming days, actually. I think that was last October. Oh right. Or yeah. something, or maybe September, and that was uh, that was a kind of a big day for us. Can you see yourselves making a review of this documentary, say, in 10 years, and how do you think the way you approach it will have changed with time? Making a what? A, a, a review of this documentary. I think revisiting the people in it. Yes? Whoever's asked that question? Uh, probably not. I don't think so. 
Do I like the optimism of the question because it, it supposes that in a decade we'll, we'll be through this. Uh, <laughs> so and that we'll both be working. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I occasionally, when I was writing, uh, tried to assume the headspace of making a film that would go into a canister uh, as a sort mm. of time capsule. Yeah. And that when it came out, you know, however many years down the line, we would watch it and it would be... Um, you know, an, an authentic description of, of the sort of atmosphere of, of, of this time. Mm. That, that was a sort of private task that I'd set myself. And I, watching it today, which is only the second time I've, I've, I've seen the film, I, I think it does grab the atmosphere, including, and I think this is really important for the film, the absurdities mm -hmm. and the, the comedy of what's been going on. You know, all, all fields of discipline have learned something from this time, but, you know, the anthropology... Uh, of the past year, our adaptability, creativity, and you know the the way that we're able to poke fun at ourselves, even through times like this, has, has been really, really important aspect of, of what's happened. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's there in the film. I think it is. Um, where do you think that the world goes from here? Do you think we will be more sympathetic? What of our shared altered state do you think will persist? I'd like to think that people have changed their attitudes, their behaviours, their relationships with each other to an extent that we might all be more thoughtful in our relationships with, with strangers and with people we, we meet. Uh, I'd like to think that we will be kinder, but who knows? I don't know. I mean, I hope, I hope films like this will, will help that process and and show people that there's a there's common ground that we all occupy and that, that is in all our interests to, you know, to kind of be kind with each other. Kind, yeah. Um, I think you can get into a, a mindset sometimes, especially if you're watching the news every day, uh, that the human race is a terrible thing. And I think... There are aspects of lockdown that have reminded us just how much good there is out there. And I think that's been a timely reminder. So even if we don't change, and there's not much evidence through the history of civilization that, that we will, but nevertheless, I, th I think just to recognize you know, the amount of, 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 of goodness and care and generosity that there is out there is, is something to carry forward. How would you feel about screening the film specifically for an audience of virus and vaccine deniers? Works as a campaign tool <laughs> as well as a piece of art. Uh, yeah, I'd love to. I'd, I'd love to show it to them and uh, see what their response would be like. I and mean, there's enough of them. There's, you, could fill, you could fill the cinema. Yes. Um, uh, you, you said that you, uh, you you don't generally have other people speaking the words in it like you have done in other films, but you had the um, the BBC newsreader, is it Sophie? Yeah, right, doing Sophie it. Can talk, talk Can you talk us through that part? That I really enjoyed that sequence. Even even the uh, the, the dodgy homemade graphics. Yeah. <laughs> uh, apologies. I for thought ours. that they were slacking a bit on it before I realized <laughs> what it was. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I I when I read uh, the the those words that part of the, the poem that Simon had written, I, I thought it sounded like something that could be put in the mouth of a newsreader. And I, you know, I spoke to Simon about that and he agreed. And uh, we got in touch with the BBC and said, you know, because we were making it for the BBC anyway, uh, and we just floated the idea. And then we got a message back very quickly saying Sophie Rayworth would love to do it <laughs> because she's a big fan of Simon's. And... Uh, she seemed particularly pleased to be doing it. <laughs> she seemed happy. She was very happy. I mean, I couldn't... The, one of the frustrating things was that because the, the, the regime that the BBC had, and perhaps still has, was that I wasn't allowed to go into, into the newsroom to, to direct her. Uh, so I had to do it all remotely but over the phone. I couldn't, you know, couldn't even see what she was doing, but I could just hear it. And I just had to kind of talk to her about the delivery. But she did a great job, I think. What would, 
what is a film? I've, I've come to the end of my submitted question, so I'll just wrap up with one and, um, and uh, thank you for your time. But um, what's a film that you would most likely to be, like to be making right now, Brian? Most likely now? No, well, what you would like to be making now if the world was uh, back to normal? Uh, I've, I've had a long, long-held ambition to revisit a film that Simon and I made called Songbirds, which was uh, a musical, a documentary musical set in a women's prison here in, here in Britain. And I'd really like to go and do it uh, with a bigger budget in the US in a women's prison. I just think it would be a really good it, thing to do. It would be something. And Simon, what, 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 we, what do you want to be doing in a year's time if well, we are through? Yeah, in relation to, to film, um, a, a version of what Brian's talked about, we, we made a film called Feltham Sings, mm -hmm. uh, where you know, we interviewed and, and wrote poems and songs for young offenders in uh, Feltham Young Offenders Institution. I would really like to find out what's happened to all those lads mm. and do a follow-up film and write for them again. I'd, I'd be so curious as to what happened to them, you know, after we'd spoke to them, seen that little part of their, of their lives. We, we've, we've talked about this a lot and think that it would make mm. an incredible film. Unfortunately, nobody else feels that way. We did propose it on the 10th anniversary of Feltham Sings to Channel 4 and... Uh, I, you know, we said it, it was a cult film, it won a BAFTA, it won the Ivy Novello Award, it was talked about a lot, and Channel 4 just said, no, we, we never look back. Well, you've, <laughs> you've spoken on the record now, we'll see who, who picks it up. Anybody so. from Channel 4 here? <laughs> um, thank you, uh, thank you for this film, thank you for coming to Sheffield, thank you all for your time, and uh, the film will be going out uh, in a couple weeks' time, next week? When on, is it? On June the 18th, on the same evening that England plays Scotland in the Euros. So, he says probably bitterly. get an audience this size. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks for coming. <laughs>